you. Hi, everybody. I'm Julia O'Brien from Lancaster Seminary, where I'm the professor of Hebrew Bible, also known as the Old Testament. And I'm really appreciative of the flexibility of everybody that could let us do this on Zoom today. I'm under COVID quarantine, so but I didn't want to miss my chance to be with you. Um, so thanks to Jack and Charlie and Sue from a distance and Bill and everybody who've kind of pulled together all the technological wonders. So thank you. I'm going to share a screen uh, today. So I hope you will be able to see that. And most of you are old Zoom pros now and know that if uh, my face is in the way of what you want to see, you can kind of move me around a little bit and play with some of your viewing options. Um, so everybody be able to see my screen? Are you pretty good? Yeah, good. So uh, this is the second of two weeks where I've been sharing some of my own interest, passion, and advocacy around issues of the climate crisis, and in particular, what it means to read the Bible in this time. It's hard to know um, now that we live stream who was here last week. So I thought it might be helpful for those who weren't here and maybe even those who were here to review just a couple of uh, highlights from what I thought we talked about last week as kind of a run up to what I'd like to share with you today. So the, the way I started is that it's my strong conviction that people always read the Bible in light of the questions that are pressing on their world. And I gave some examples last week of how we know this has always been the case of people have turned to the Bible, more interested in certain things than other things, depending on what's going on, whether it's slavery or women's rights, marriage equality, abortion rights. We, we turn to the Bible and we ask different questions at different times in our lives. I think it would be hard to overestimate just how uh, serious the climate crisis that we are in right now is. In fact, I, I kind of scaled back my title for this series because I told Bill that I wanted to call it the Bible and the climate catastrophe. Um, he suggested maybe that was a little strong, although I will share with you that is the way I understand it. We are facing some inevitabilities as well as some changeable issues, but whether we're gonna call it the crisis, a catastrophe, um, if you know anything about the science that is now being shared with us, we know the situation is incredibly dire. And so anything that, if you're not um, up on that and you're interested in learning more, I mentioned the kind of gold standard is the, uh, UN Intergover Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but there are lots of wonderful podcasts that are available, um, such as How to Save a Planet, uh, Science Friday often has lots of climate-related issues. There, there's lots of great information, both the technical and the not-so-technical that are out there. We, we know some of this just from our own experience of recognizing that things are changing. Um, my own garden is radically different than it was 10 years ago um, about when I can plant things, how they're gonna work. Life is changing. <clears throat> and so uh, it is that reality that whether, in and, and I decided I really didn't want to have this big conversation about uh, can we argue about whether that's human caused or not, because in some ways it doesn't matter. We still face the same realities of whatever the cause right now. Um, and yet recognizing the role that human uh, actions play in it will help drive our actions in the future. 
So I always want to start there, that the, the reality of the world is where we must always start. And that's why I think my own judgment is that some of the earlier ways in which Christians and other folks have tried to read the Bible in light of environmental concerns, in my judgment, aren't quite adequate anymore. So one of the ways that is a long-standing, but not forever long-standing, way of looking at the problem is to pit religion against science. So last week, I kind of reminded some of us of a certain age about the earlier work of folks like Tim LaHaye, um, who did the original Left Behind books, um, The Late Great Planet Earth, uh, lots of approaches that kind of looked at the world and interpreted it as the countdown to when Jesus' second coming would be. So really not concerned about the earth in and of itself, but instead of uh, kind of cautioning Christians that the world that Jesus is soon to come, and it really doesn't matter what our actions are. And this would include, uh, LaHaye said, uh, there's really no re need to address poverty or other social issues because Jesus will soon return. So I have him on, on one side. Um, on the other side, I have Lynn White. In 1967, Lynn White wrote this very still influential article that kind of blamed the Jewish and Christian traditions, mostly Christian traditions, for actually causing the problems that we now face. And what Lynn Wright argued, um, and again, people are still talking about this, it's all over the internet, if, if you wanna look at it, is that by having an, um, a thought process, ex especially as expressed in Genesis chapter one, that humans should have dominion over the earth is actually the root of the ecological problem because it is our sense that the world is here for our benefit and it is a resource for us to use in any way that we want to that feeds this idea that we can do anything we want as long as it's good for humans or at least some rich humans. So he, he really uh, wanted to place the blame on religious traditions. And this, this attitude that pits religions against science is still posited in a lot of different places. Obviously, those aren't very helpful ways forward for us to see our problem as having to choose between religion or science. And, and we'll talk about some alternatives a little bit later. I did share that uh, many of you are already involved in some of these efforts as well. There's also been a strong approach that treats our responsibility toward earth as stewardship. Um, that is that it is human beings responsibility to care for the earth. Um, and so, uh, had looked at various denominational and church um, descriptions of this, of creation care, of stewardship, of um, taking care of the earth, your mother. These approaches have done a lot of good work. They, they have invited us to see the beauty of creation, to care about plants as um, and species of animals as they've uh, gone extinct. So they've been really important, but there are many current thinkers who suggest that this approach is really a little too soft and thin for the reality that we're in right now. And I mentioned last week the uh, project that's running out of the University of Exeter in the UK. And one of the things they point out is that as long as we think about stewardship, we're still thinking of ourselves as having the right to manage the world. And one of the things that the Exeter folks and other people's 
uh, in the same vein ask us to think about is when we think about ourselves as stewards, um, what, what does that imply about our relationship between God, humanity, and non-human creatures? It still puts us at the top of the pecking order. And the complaint that many folks are making is, is that it, it is that human self-focus, what we call that uh, anthropocentrism, you know, all that focus on ourselves that has gotten into this problem, that, that our needs for energy, for food, for things take precedence uh, over all else. And so uh, there, there are some folks who aren't as comfortable using words like stewardship um, and creation care in ways that might have been true in some of the earlier earth movements, I would say in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, and another reason that some folks uh, don't find images of like creation care or caring for God's creation adequate is they would claim that the earth is not as God has created it to be. <laughs> it is now damaged and, and we have damaged it. So as long as we think about a maintenance routine, right, we've kind of missed the reality of the severe damage that humans have already done. And again, if, if we look at some of the, the science, they're telling us that some of the effects of climate change are now inevitable. There are some things we can't change. There's now enough carbon in the oceans that certain things are not gonna change, but there are things that can be changed. So it's not, it's not, not everything is reversible at this stage. So um, as I suggested last time, we kind of ended on a pretty downer note. It, it, I'll be honest, it's pretty overwhelming. And in fact, there's, there's, I listen to a lot of podcasts and there's a lot that are talking about climate anxiety and climate depression, um, that there are, um, it, it's actually, especially for young people, it, it's, a, it's a serious issue of feeling fatalistic, of feeling like nothing can be done. Um, and so uh, one of the things that was important to me uh, today is to say, these things are true, right? The, the realities are true. The crisis is real and some of it will come to pass right? Even if we change our behavior now, we still have to pay the credit card bill, right? There, there are realities that are, are, that are catching up with us. And, and, right, there are alternatives, right? Ways that Christians, I believe, can both read our Bible, our sacred text for good, and also be part of helping uh, any mitigation that is possible in the future. So I thought I would share at least some of my own understandings this morning of what are some things, what can we be doing, particularly as it's regarding um, religion and climate change and also how we're using our Bible in this moment. So, yes. So what are they, what are some alternatives? And then I want to hear what you have to. I think the best thing, uh, or one of the best things, and one of the most important things that Christians can do is to bring science to church more often. Right? Now, I don't attend dairy, right? I don't attend all the churches of those who are online. So I don't know what you're getting in your churches. I know what I get in the churches that I go to. I rarely hear any words that come from the scientific realm. I don't hear people talking about biological diversity. I don't hear folks talking about evolution. I don't hear people talking about the genome. I, I don't hear that kind of language. And so what it feeds, I think, unintentionally, 
but nonetheless, is this idea that religion and science can't talk to each other, that they're, that they're different modes of being. Um, and so one of the wonderful resources that you might want to know about is there's a website called Science for Seminaries. It, it's actually designed by folks who are teaching in seminaries, but it's trying to provide resources to help religious leaders in the future. And they have some wonderful videos up, and, and now we're going to see if I can show you part of one. Um, this is an advantage of Zoom, maybe. Um, we're at, where scientists are sharing their, uh, their own understanding of how science and religion fit together. So let's see how the technology works. What do you think? And I have to advance it a little bit. Let's try right around there. And then give me a thumbs up if you hear this The order sound. of the day versus convergence, well, evolutionary biologists are working that out. Understanding our evolutionary history helps us understand who we are today. So evolutionary biology has incredible value for understanding how humans work. So I think the discussion that's really interesting between religious thinkers and scientists is, is after, is getting over this question of, well, is, you know, did evolution really happen? The more interesting question is, how should we think about the role of humanity and the role of individual lives and our meaning and purpose here in light of evolution, in light of our evolutionary history? And when we look at other critters, we understand much more about ourselves. We understand how our cells work, how our cells divide, how they die. You know, the trick of understanding much of cancer and some of the cell biology of cancers understand means understanding other creatures. So I like to think that as we discover cures from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will in some way be based on flies, worms, and in some cases even fish. You know, I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our evolutionary connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. There are so many examples of scientists who are um, trying to, to get over some of these divides about um, was the world created in six literal days or um, are there alternate modes of understanding where the earth came from? They're trying to get beyond that and begin to talk about how our in continued understanding of the interconnections of everything on our planet, including the roots of the trees that communicate with each other, um, which is a fascinating thing I just read about, um, about how this not only gives us greater wonder and appreciation for the world, but how much it enhances our understanding of some of the undergirding truths of the Bible, that we are connected, that we all come from one place. And there, again, there are just some very beautiful um, videos there and other places to learn about how um, understanding of science doesn't have to work against a spiritual understanding that our own connection with earth belongs together. And so I, I talk with this and will increasingly talk with about this with students um, that I teach as they're preparing for religious leadership of how can you use biblical words, but also use words that people encounter in their daily lives around science together so that how will you help people make connections in that way? Um, so uh, alternative one, bring science to church, like talk about it, bring it together, right? Make it, make it work. Okay, ready for another one? Come on, not easy. I think that anytime 
we understand our world better. And when something is foremost in our mind and in our sight, we can notice it better in the Bible itself. Right? That, that again, my, my claim is that if you have a concern for something, you're going to notice you're going to notice what the Bible has to say. And so one of the things that's been happening in biblical studies as folks have tried to bring it together with um, ecological consciousness is they pointed out that the Bible is a amazing resource and testimony to people who have undergone other types of environmental crises over time. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament were written in agrarian economies, especially the old, but, but also the new. Think about how often you've heard stories in the Bible that talk about drought, that talk about famine, that talk about floods, that talk about insect infestation invitations. These are passages, I believe, that we can now reclaim as ways to help us talk about our current situation. And um, as a Old Testament professor, I think especially about just how rich the Old Testament gives us these resources. So I thought I'd give you just a couple of examples, you know, passages that I'm sure you read all the time, like the book of Joel. Most folks only know about the book of Joel from reading it on Ash Wednesday, right, where we get to a passage where it talks about sackcloth and ashes. But Joel, uh, the, the whole first chapter of Joel is just a devastating lament about the devastation that a locust plague, right, which is often driven by environmental changes, um, has placed on the land. So I wonder what would happen if we knew that we had texts like this to offer people to use as laments when these environmental crises happened. So don't mean to insult you, but I'm gonna read that out loud. Be dismayed, you farmers. Wail, you vine dressers, over the wheat and the barley, for the crops of the field are ruined. The vine withers, the fig tree droops, pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely, joy withers away among the people. The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate. The granaries are ruined because the grain has failed. How the animals groan. Interesting. There's passage that cares about the animals groaning, not just the people. The herds of cattle wander about because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep are dazed. Such a a powerful statement, and particularly for me, communities that are going through devastation, to be able to offer words, preformed words for the lament and the pain and the devastation is a resource to, to have something to say, to recognize the realities of our world. I'll share another example that was shared with me by one of my students. Um, this past spring, I taught a class online on the book of Isaiah, and, and one of the students, I'll mention him again later, Kevin Long, who's a good Presbyterian from your Presbytery, right, um, actually did his interpretation project on Isaiah 24 in the environmental crisis, right, and what Kevin pointed out is just the strength of this kind of a passage as a description that can resonate in our own time about what's going on with the earth. The earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, 
for they have transgressed laws, violated statues, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse devours the earth and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth dwindled and few people are left. Really powerful resources. And um, what I mean by the fact that there is a gift in having pre-formed laments for us is that most of us know that in times of grief and crisis, it's hard to create new liturgies, new resources. It's why when we have funerals, we tend to go back to the same passages over and over again, because there is something about knowing that others have been in this situation and that our sacred texts give us something that's really powerful um, and, and to, to feel those connections with the Bible. And yet, right, I, I need to put a note of caution. Right? One of the things that's going to be different about particularly Old Testament texts, but also New Testament texts, in our own situation, in my judgment, is that there is often assumed or stated in the biblical text that the devastation on the earth is God's punishment, right? That God is doing it in response to human sin. And I, Kevin and I had this conversation about his project. I said, you know, one of the things we do need to recognize is that in a passage like um, Isaiah 24, it does say that, that God's going to do this, that this is God's punishment for people's violating the covenant and doing bad things. I, you have your own theologies, you have your own ways of understanding of the world. So I can, I can share mine with you, I can share my own with you, and then ultimately you'll need to decide how it fits with your own belief system and your theology. I think it's, I think it's important to recognize that the ancient world lived at a time where the assumption was is that the deity did everything, right? We, we know this. I'm a scholar of the ancient Near East and the Old Testament, and, and we can see this, that, that everything that happened was understood to happen from God, even the normal stuff like rain, snow, childbirth, all, all things came from God. Um, and if you've read a lot of the Bible, you know that even when a woman was not able to have a child, it was understood as God closing her womb. This is not a worldview that I share in the present. I, I do, I, I have been affected and do believe that while God is still ultimately, right, involved in all creation, that there are also other explanations of uh, infertility, of rainfall patterns. Again, I'm not trying to rule God out. And yet I do come from a world in which I do believe in natural law and science and all of that. So that when I read a text like this, I need to recognize that this was a culture. And again, this is too, true in the New Testament too, a culture that was trying to explain everything as God's activity and not just individual things. I do think for me that the most helpful way I can read a passage like Isaiah 24 and the Joel passage that I read before is to recognize that human activity does have consequences. It, it does uh, pay off. Um, I'm, I'm going to choose not to perpetuate the idea that God is intentionally punishing humanity for doing that. Um, I'm personally going to choose to talk about it in a way that there are ways of being in the world 
in light of God that when we violate those, we disrupt creation and all creation is disorder. Again, I don't, you know, kind of hard when we're not all in the same room to kind of check if you get what I'm saying. But in other words, I do think using a lot of passages that um, assume God directly punishes people for misbehavior is not going to help us in the climate crisis as much as recognizing that when we violate the ways in which it means to be with God and with each other on this world, there will be devastation of our world. There are so many connections. When you start reading the Bible in light of the natural world, there's just like, uh, sometimes I think, why, why haven't people talked about this more? Why, why, is it, why haven't people made more connections? And so I'll think about a passage that even more people know about than, than Joel and Isaiah 24. And, and that is how often the Bible talks about climate refugees. Right? How often the Bible talks about climate refugees. So I assume you know what I mean by a climate refugee. And so I thought I would pull up a couple of statistics. Um, this was from a recent Newsweek article. Um, since 2010, more than 21 million people have been di displaced by climate change related disasters, according to the UN. And that number could rise to 1.2 billion by 2050. Um, and we know this, if, if you haven't ever seen these, go online and look at sea rise. Um, there's a, a wonderful uh, interactive graphic from the National Oceanic and Atm Atmospheric and Oceanic thing where you can watch sea level rise over a certain period of time. It's like a a video that will play, but we, we're already knowing this, that like by 2050, most of a big portion of Bangladesh will be gone. Um, 20 people may have lost their homes. I heard a recent podcast about the Maldives and how they're trying to figure out new ways. What Will they move their entire country to avoid this incredible flooding? Already, um, the issues of drought and climate change are making food insecurity in places that were already food insecure um, even greater. So um, this, oh, here's, I have one more. Oh, I thought there was another one. Never mind. But the, the point was, is that um, we, we are gonna see increasing number of people who move around due to inhabitable places to live and food insecurity. Why then <laughs> have we not noticed this when we read books like the Book of Ruth? Uh, the Book of Ruth, in my experience, people either love it because it's got really powerful women characters or it shows one person being faithful to another after the loss of a husband, or maybe they just care about it because there's a baby at the end who becomes the ancestor of Jesus. But Ruth and Naomi are both climate refugees, right? They're food insecurity refugees. I mean, that's the way the book starts. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a whole family relocated because there was a famine in the land. And they went to a new country, a place they might not have even liked, in order to find food. And there, there was loss of life. And if you look at the top of this second column, right, they'd been there a while. And they noticed they, they only leave again because the food insecurity got back where they were before. And if you, if you know the book of Ruth, it's all about food, 
right? Ruth gleans in the field. She goes to the threshing floor because it is now the grain harvest. This is a story about two women in a situation who have food insecurity and land insecurity. Ruth is such a powerful example of a climate refugee and how, what women face when they are refugees, um, the threat of violence in the fields. Even Boaz has to say, stay close to my young men so they won't bother you, right? Bother you? I think that's a pretty tame um, word actually for what the Hebrew says molest you so they will not molest you um there's so many stories about this abraham and sarah move around all the time because there's famine and drought um we even see this in the new testament have you heard anybody talk about the story of the prodigal son as as a place to pointing out the famine that happens and the running out of food that happens there, there's so many ways in which the natural world and its um, unpredictability find resonance in the biblical text. So you can tell I like this part. I, I, I love um, uh, what's sometimes called an agrarian reading of the Bible is to begin to recognize that, that our, our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors knew more about what it meant to live in light of the changing realities of climate than we do. I think as we're doing this work or as I'm doing this work, um, I'm committed to making sure that we get honest about the Bible. I, mean, I mentioned that kind of before because I do think it's important to recognize that I might not share all of the same worldviews of those writers that believe God was punishing uh, humanity by devastating the earth. But also, I do think we need to be honest, and I'm choosing to be honest, when it sounds like sometimes the ideas in the Bible might be part of the problem. So I do think that critique, when critique is due, is still a, an important task um, as we go forward. And we mentioned last time Psalm 8, uh, which is beautiful. Um, you know, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you know, what are human beings that you are so mindful of? but you've made them a little lower than God and given them dominion and put all things under their feet. I, I do think we have to find a way to, to find the richness, richness of these texts, but also not continue this idea that whatever is good for people is good, is good, right? Because we know that's not the case. And I, I do think that we have a history. We're willing to do this on some things, to be honest about the Bible. When we talk about slavery, the status of women, we, we, many folks have been willing to point out that there are certain attitudes in the Bible that we don't want to carry forward. And I think this needs to be another case where what I call getting, about, getting honest about the Bible is really important. Right? So, um, I don't know. How, how's everybody doing? You still there? Everybody there? Because now I want to do, uh, I want to make one more pitch. Right? I'm increasingly convinced that what I've been doing with you, talking, is probably not the most effective way that we're going to get any change. I mean, it's important. We, we, we got to communicate in some way. But I'm increasingly convinced that the church, that activism must embrace, claim, and use the power of art, right? Um, at Lancaster Seminary, uh, we actually have a required course in Christianity and the arts that I coordinate. And I think in the process of teaching, I've learned 
more than I ever did before is that art can move people, that it can give them a feeling, it, it can move people in ways that words don't always do. And so as I was thinking about what, what, what art, right, might move people to, to care about these kinds of issues, um, I discovered the photography of someone named Nick Brandt. Um, this is Nick. And then in a few minutes, I'll tell you a story about Nick, uh, my interaction with Nick. But um, Nick is a photographer who has committed himself to dealing with extinct species in Africa. So he's used his photography skills in a really artful way to do this. So what he does, and I'll see if I can explain this image uh, from him. So what he'll do is he'll, he'll take a photo of a nearly extinct animal, in this case, rhinos, and then what he does is he enlarges that photographic image to life size. And then he physically places that, you know, that big board, photographic board in the space that used to be that animal's habitat. So in this case, what, what's being done is Rhinos used to live where there is now people living among trash. And I, I have found Nick's work so provocative because he does certain things. It's like he restores what's been erased, right? What's been made extinct. He, he's bringing back what's extinct and showing you that in losing that, it's not just that humans have gotten, have benefited, but that the devastation of these animals has gone side by side with the devastation of and um, the horror of human life too. Um, these are some really powerful images. Uh, he has this one really struck me. These, the just sad, sad images of people on a trash heap. Um, and this one underpass with elephants and glue sniffing children. He, he's also put elephants, this is where elephants used to live, which is now an underpass where kids are trying to escape the realities of their own lives by sniffing glue. Um, it's Nick, I, I mentioned him last time, but I'll, this, this is the guy I meant that when I ask him permission to use these photos for teaching purposes, he said, only if you can explain something to me. Why are religious people the greatest obstacles to any change around climate justice issues? And I said, Nick, I can't explain that other than religious people are people, right? Religious people are people. And all I can tell you is that I'm trying to do my part to make that not always be the case. Um, I have found that, that that kind of imagery, when placed behind a sermon or behind a teaching experience, is, is incredibly powerful. Um, so uh, visual art, photography, you know, this isn't just a photograph, it's also artistically manipulated photography has been really powerful. Um, and another form of art, I, I think novels are an incredibly powerful way of moving people toward different thoughts. So I don't know if you know that there's a whole genre of fiction right now called cli-fi, climate fiction. So I've been reading a lot of this. And, and one of the, these were two that really stood out to me. Uh, one of the first ones I read was The Overstory. 
um, by Richard Powers, and then more recently, <clears throat> Greenwood. And one of the things that climate fiction does is that it helps, it helps me begin to recognize, to begin to imagine alternative futures. So I'll be honest, a lot of these are very, in some ways, dystopian, you know, about how bad things are. Some of you know the, the writer Octavia Butler, an African-American uh, early cli-fi writer. Hers are somewhat um, dark too, but what, they, what they've taught me about is human resilience, and they've begun to help me even imaginatively prepare for a different way of living that's probably in my future, but certainly within my children and grandchildren's future, of what it will mean to live with less water, of what it will mean to not be able to have the sun fully uh, you know, how much sunscreen people are going to need. It, they, they begin to, to help people recognize the humanity of people who will need to live through alternative realities. And so, you know, I think about how many book clubs, I mean, how many churches have book clubs that read fiction, not just um, biblical or not just religious books, um, I've been, I, I used to go to uh, Sunday school classes that would read like the Red Tent or read the Da Vinci Code or read something together. So, you know, I often wonder, like, what would it mean to have book clubs in churches that read cli-fi um, as well? Um, I was going to show you uh, another type of art is a little too long for the, the time we have, but there's also incredible, incredible um, video artistry out there that, that helps us see the beauty of science and creation in that way. But I want to end, if you thought I was going to get too optimistic, you know, I, I want to kind of come back to some kind of reality stuff too. Um, there are ways in which the alternatives I've suggested so far aren't really that hard, right? We, we could talk about science. We could um, point out that books like Ruth and Joel and other places talk about that our spiritual ancestors knew what it meant to, to work with the earth, there, there are a lot of things that we can keep doing, but I think one of the challenges that some, that some people are going to be willing to take up, but it's going to be hard, is that I think if there's truly to be change, the church, as well as people outside the church, I don't, I don't think this is, is only a, a Christian issue, that we're going to have to challenge some of the values built into the society, into our society that have actually undermined the earth. So some of you may not appreciate what I'm getting ready to say, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? I'm, I'm at a safe distance from you on Zoom. This is a very challenging book to me, right? Um, she's not alone. Um, Naomi Klein, um, it's a little bit older book right now, 2014, I think. Um, her argument is that the climate will, we will never address climate issues as long as we accept the religion of capitalism. Um, her argument, and again, she's, she's doing this based on her reporting, and she said that that the, the logic of capitalism, that there always must be growth, there, that we almost, always must be consumers, that we all must always do more, buy more, produce more, and that that's what makes a healthy economy is actually, is what's ruining our planet. And this idea that profit and convenience 
our ultimate values. She said that that is what has gotten us into this place and what must be challenged. And so what she's calling is for some really countercultural work to be able to recognize what would it mean for religious and other communities to challenge some of those value systems. And guess what? The, the Bible, I think, can give us some resources to do that. Oh, this is a quote from her, um, that our economic system and our planetary system are at war. Our, our economy is at war with life on Earth. What the climate needs to avoid collapse is contraction in our use of resources, not our not our expansion. So we're left with a stark choice. Allow climate disruption to change everything about our world or change everything about our economy to avoid that. And you know, we, we could have a conversation about um, how the war in Ukraine has uh, made it harder to get and harder to pay for gas and how that's led to rolling back some climate protections. So, I, I mean, I've, I'm acknowledging the, these are not easy conversations to have. And yet there is a sense, I think many of us know that our convenience economy, our growth economy, um, those plastic water bottles, right? The, the disposable nature of that, um, yeah, um, anyway, so we keep doing it. But I do think, and, and many folks have pointed out, that our tradition gives us some alternative values that might moderate some of that hyper-consumption model. And one of them is right there in the Ten Commandments. Um, we often think about the Sabbath day as just an issue of rest that, that human beings and their families and property and animals deserve rest. I'm not talking about the slaves right now, which is another whole topic right there. But, but notice it's not just saying do that so that then you can go work harder, but that there is something more important than productivity, right? And so that built into the patterns of life is a break in productivity. Uh, often people point to Sabbath and also um, you may know about the sabbatical year or the, the Sabbath year. Um, it's found in Leviticus 25, this idea that every seventh year the, the land should should be allowed to rest. Now, we might think of this as a farming management practice, and, and I'm sure that it is, but, it, but it's also in this way of biblical thinking, a recognition that we don't have the right to max out all the resources, that it is um, a, a call to restraint, right? There's so much in the Bible that suggests that. Um, and it, it is interesting. Many people have suggested that when Jesus stands up in the synagogue and chooses which passage to read um, in his hometown, that he, he wants to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And for some people, they believe that it's that sabbatical year, uh, that it's a, a a time of liberation. And so um, as we're finishing up, um, I think all of this process has led me, at least of where I am in the process now, is to, to come back to um, Lynn White, who said that the problem with the world is Genesis chapter one, um, that humans are given dominion. And this whole process has laid, made me want to lift up, not Genesis chapter one so much, but Genesis chapters two and three. Um, this is the part of the story where Adam and Eve are put in the garden to tend and keep it. 
and there's a tree placed in the midst of the garden and they're told not to eat from it. Now, a lot of people have pointed out, well, that's like telling a toddler, you know, like putting the, the goldfish on the table and saying, don't eat those. You know, like, why would, why would God do that? But, you know, it, it is um, an image of that when you are placed in goodness, in the midst of goodness and abundance, there are some things that are off limits, right? And that it is human ability, inability to show restraint that has caused our problems. So the, the Genesis chapter two actually gives me hope uh, that the idea that humans might be able to learn how to have restraint over time and to, to begin to find hope. One of the main things, oh, I had one more thing to show you. I was trying to stop. But there's a lot of things that give me hope. One is that there's a lot of young people out there who are doing really great work. I'll just briefly minute, mention um, this, this book, All We Can Save, that says you don't have to know the details of science to be part of the solution. And if you wait till you know everything, it'll be too late to do anything. Don't start from scratch. There are a lot of people out there that are doing this work. And so I wanted to, to uh, call out one more time uh, this Presbyterian student I mentioned earlier, he just graduated, Kevin Long, who's beginning a new intentional community in the Presbytery called Intertwined that's devoted to the climate, to climate justice and the climate issue. Um, he's just getting it up and running. There's the website if you'd like to, to look at it. He also has an Instagram page. So I do think that there are, we don't all have to start from scratch, but it is my belief that this is the issue that our churches must address. And so my own sharing with you is my attempt to do that. So we have a couple of minutes before our recording goes off. Do, do you have questions, comments, thoughts? No, but one of the things that has always disturbed me based on what you've been discussing today is the way business has changed. And we think nothing of saving a dollar to buy something from uh, a, 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 over the uh, computer and ignore the the five dollars worth of cost of the packing that comes in and what do you do with it you we're know, saving an hour we apparently are saving a dollar but we're costing this not only us but everything and we do that we're very very short-sighted we are very uh selfish we i'm talking to the society we're very selfish when it comes to our own personal convenience, not what's good for the community or mankind. It's just me and mine. Yeah, and, and again, I, I should have started this over. I, you know, I, I repent. I, I'm part of the problem too. It's not like I'm you know, beyond that. And so one of the, one of the interesting moves, uh, many shareholders of corporations are calling them to build into their business models the environmental cost of what they're doing so that when the boards are making decisions, they can make those kind of decisions. And I've often thought about this too, that if we were, if we were paying out of pocket for the actual cost of the, uh, like when I, when I get things off, off of Amazon, right? When I get things, off, if, I, if it were building in the cost of the climate impact, could I afford it? Right. Could I really, if we were really paying the, the true cost of things, um, you know, like what counts as cost? Well, if you're paying the true cost of an Amazon product, isn't it cheaper to go to the guy down the street that may charge a dollar more? Well, and you know, th there's See, a that, wonderful, that's, that's well, the whole... yes, those things get shipped too. And yeah, it well, but, I mean, it's complicated. It depends but it's, on it's less. 
Well, it depends. So there's a, a, a should have, there's so much resources out there. There are also uh, climate impact calculators uh, online where you can actually figure out, you can do your own home, you can do how much energy your church is using. Um, it, it, is, it is overwhelming. And so individual choices make a, a huge difference. Um, and it's going to be major at the governmental policy levels where major change is going to happen. To change the subject quick before we leave, I had the, pl the pleasure of being in a meeting with Kevin this past week. Oh, good. And, and that sounds exciting to me. Uh, yeah. he, he's off on a new venture that is going to shake the roots of the way we always do things. And I think he's on to something. I agree. I agree. Plug for Kevin Long. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I really appreciate you uh, allowing me to, to join you by Zoom today. And um, thank you for wh whatever you'll do, right? That uh, the main thing we can do is to not let this be a science versus church thing. It's, the church has to be right in there. So hoping we can all join together to do that. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Well, it's great to see you all. Thanks Thank very you. much, Julia. We Bye. look forward Take to care. seeing you next year. Okay. I'll email you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.